You are listening to the Think Brick Australia podcast. Think Brick Australia represents the clay, brick and paver manufacturers of Australia. Brick by Brick, our podcast will discuss technical information and architectural case studies with special guests. I'm your host, Elizabeth McIntyre, the CEO of Think Brick Australia. I'm Scott Woodward, and this is the Think Brick podcast. On today's podcast, it's another pleasure of mine and a highlight of this role to interview one of our longest supporters of Brick. In fact, I'm sure there's not a year where they haven't built something in Brick. Scott Woodward from Wa 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 Architecture. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's our pleasure. And it's been a long history of all the BRICS projects that you've entered into the awards and constructed over all of this time. And you've been such a wonderful supporter of what we've done as well. But before we talk about BRIC and your architecture and buildings, can we start with a little bit about your childhood and what it was like growing up? So my parents built our house back in the early 80s and my dad's a total hoarder so one of the first things he did was he drove past a building site that just had a whole heap of cream bricks that from something that had just been knocked down so he just got them to deliver all of those bricks to our house and dump them in the front garden which was still a building site at the time (laughs) and pretty much we got paid i think it was about 10 cents a brick my brother and i to chip off all the mortar on these bricks so yeah that was the first sort of interaction it's like we graduated from lego straight into actual bricks and building things in the back garden with brick so yeah we sort of chip all the mortar off go over in the garden somewhere and start stacking them up and it started as just normal stacks yeah and then we started getting a little bit more like crazy and creative with the way that we were actually stacking all of those bricks so yeah 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 and my dad was an um, engineer background okay. And he used to do a little bit of drafting on the side as well. So it was a sort of sideways step into architecture for me. Oh, right. And was it 30,000 bricks? Was it the average, do you Um, remember? Or, I mean, did you build a double brick house or was it single? It was single skin. It was very homesteady style. Right. And, yeah, he got all these bricks to do the paving in for the the driveway and for the veranda around the house. Right. Wow. So it really recycled. Yeah. Is the house still there today? It is, but they sold it maybe 10 years ago. But, yeah, it's still there. It's still there. And so um, you just touched on a little bit. Obviously, you had the manual kind of labour there. Yeah. But when did you know that architecture was for you? I accidentally fell into architecture. I did fine art before architecture. Okay. So I was at RMIT, I did the degree course there and at the end of final year, there's an exhibition and the Dean of Architecture at RMIT at the time bought a couple of pieces that I had in that exhibition, Sand Helsel. And yeah, at the opening we were just having a chat and she was like, I think that you should do architecture. And I was like, okay, that sounds good. That sounds like I don't have to do anything for another five years at least. So I'm just going to do that. So she just arranged for me to get into the course, which is really good because I don't think I would have got in if she didn't sort of put me through the back door kind of thing. So, yeah, it was just a complete but accidental you thing. you finished fine arts. Yeah, I finished and, fine arts. Yeah. And I think that all the work that I was doing while I was practising was very much engaged with architecture. Like it was working a lot with suburban conditions playing around with suburban house forms and sort of mapping in the city of just plans of houses and things like that. So yeah. it was always had that bent on it. Yeah. Yeah. And when you, can I take a step further backwards? Yeah. What made you do fine arts? I mean, where did um, that come from? I guess I'm not really sure. It was just something like I never really sketched or anything like that. But when I originally went to get into fine arts course, I was trying to get into painting because I really liked painting, but I was kind of a bit crap at it. So I didn't get into painting, but then they offered me a spot in sculpture instead. So, yeah, I ended up just taking that spot, thinking I'll start that and then I'll go into painting and then just stayed in sculpture the whole way through and really enjoyed that kind of process and the construction and the designing and just thinking three-dimensionally. So... And also, yeah, what a great sort of prerequisite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you obviously enjoyed university. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) Yeah, For at least 10 years. Oh, wow. 
Wow. And when you started architecture, did any architects make an impression on you when you were looking? Because you obviously haven't come in with any preconceived ideas is what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's funny because I studied overseas, did a year of study in the Netherlands. Okay. And when I went over there, it was in Utrecht. And at the time, you know, there was a lot of OMA buildings, some of the really influential OMA buildings that were in construction. Okay. And I remember riding past them, you know, on the way to Union and it was always really interesting, but it was just not engaged at all in architecture. It was all just about fine art going to the galleries. But yeah. it's sort of funny because I registered and thinking back to it, like after starting architecture, yeah, it was just really strange thinking, God, I wish I'd have paid more attention to what was actually happening in terms of the buildings that were being built around me at the time. When did you go to the Netherlands? That was 94. Okay. And that was just an exchange program with RMIT and it was the first one that they did. Okay. It was funny because it was two girls from the Netherlands that contacted RMIT and said, we want to do an exchange program, are you up for it? And then, yeah, they invited people who were interested within the sculpture department and I got one of the places and then basically we just swapped right. lives. Like they moved in with the share house that I was in and then we moved into their house. So wow. yeah, it was really, really funny, but it was a great experience. It was really awesome. What were your key takeaways from that one? It was funny because I think that there was always that perception that, you know, we were kind of inferior over here in you know Australia in terms of oh, our really? practice. But when we went over there, we realised there were three of us that went over and we just realised how hard we were actually working in terms of just doing work and constantly being producing. Because when we went over there, within the first month, we produced almost more work than the rest of the students produ- produced for the entire year. Wow. And they were a bit like, what are you doing? Slow down, like, you know, take your time. And yeah, a lot of the teachers were just shocked by the amount of stuff and how active we were in making things happen yeah, as well so okay. like really that was really interesting, interesting. yeah, yeah. How, do you know how they found it over here they had no they had a really great time too right. yeah they moved out of the share house that i was in pretty quickly because the two guys i was living with at the time were kind of quite particular cats so yeah they only lasted about three months and then they went off and right. found other places to live but you know my, one of my friends dated one of them for quite a while and they stay in touch now so and did did they keep up with the workload then if you said there was a bit of a gear change there did they adapt to that yeah they did and they produced really amazing stuff while they were here i mean it was a really good course at the time it was peter cripps and robert owen so it was a really good group of people who were actually teaching at that time we're now up to you starting the architecture degree so now the five years yeah right and you've gone in with very little expectation yeah and how did you find it? I think they just got really inspired while they were here and yeah, produced really amazing work. So I remember the first main crit that we had at the end of the first semester that I did. And in art, when you were talking about your work, it was always very open-ended. So, you know, you'd go, oh, it's about the idea of blah, 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 blah. And then pulling out all of that stuff in that crit they really drill down on you and it's not it's not about the idea of what is the idea so it was much more specific and focused uh-huh. and that was yeah that was a real shock at the start and that was again trying to change gears into the way that you talk about architecture mm-hmm. it felt like it was a little bit different just how much more focused and you know accurate you had to be in terms of the the way that you actually spoke about ideas and the work and did you fall in love with it because you sort of <laughs> fell into it Was there a point where things just clicked for you? So most of the art stuff I was doing at the end was outdoor temporal stuff. So I was doing mostly working with sticky tape and going out into spaces and making huge sort of like sticky tape drawings. Right. And I did a heap in Utrecht when I was living there and they were all just about the old churches that had disappeared from the space. So it was going back out and marking out where all of their footings and spaces oh, were. So okay. they, were, they were really, really large. Like there was about five to six kilometres of tape in each piece. And you used to go out, when it got dark, you'd go out into one of the squares and start taping everything out. And then in the morning, it'd just be there and people would sort of go, what the f- is this kind of thing. So it always had this sort of architectural element. So it was engaged with it and it just felt like it transitioned into actually yeah, doing architecture and designing it wasn't a massive step but yeah I just sort of enjoyed that it was kind of like a real 
thing as well. So it did quite a few shows. When you were sculpting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you end up setting everything up, doing all the work, setting it up in the gallery, and then sitting there for three or four days minding the gallery and maybe 10 people would come in over, you know, four or five hours or something. And it felt a little bit of a lonely existence. Yeah, right, yeah. And, yeah, maybe I just wasn't cut out for that. So I really liked the you know, architecture, you were working with someone, it was a collaborative process mm. and the outcome had a bigger, whether it's a family home or whether, you know, it's a civic building, it has like a bigger impact. Um, yeah, yeah. impact yeah. Did you travel in those five years when you were still studying? I'd done a second stint in Holland as well at the Rietveld Academy because okay. someone dropped out of okay. the, the exchange program. I was doing an honours year and that was after San said, you know, come and do architecture. So I wasn't really fully committed to doing that and I was filling a gap for the school so I didn't really get much done okay. while I was over there yeah but yeah there was a bit of a break I think until yeah doing sort of further travel after during that time were there any architects that made an impression on you yeah I think ARM really early on because when they were doing their story hall project there was heaps of discussion about it in the art department because it was out there project and even the way that they treated the gallery space that's sort of next to Story Hall as well. A lot of the, the first opening exhibition they had, I remember there was an artist called Deborah Ostro. Okay. And her piece that she did in it was she just went down to Franco Cozzo and borrowed a whole heap of furniture and like put that into the space. And she was talking about how she just felt like she needed something really overly gestural to compete with the level of architecture within the space. So there was a lot of discussion about how, you know, it just wasn't a white box and how you actually do installation work within that space. So there was a, that sort of had a really big impact. And I think that that was one of the things that really opened my eyes to what architecture could potentially be as well. Yeah. So that was a sort of really first, that was the first practice that I really took an interest in and really started to engage with. Okay. So you finish university for the second time now with an architecture <laughs> degree and what do you do then i got a job at bruce henderson architects yes and it was yeah it was really amazing because it was they were sort of starting to try and pitch themselves as focusing more on a design practice and they had a whole lot of graduates in at that time and had some really amazing people like Andrew Walter was there Jean-Paul Rollo Mel Bright was there yes, as yeah. well so that was the first time I ever interacted with Mel outside of school so it was a really interesting time and we all lasted there for about a year and then we all kind of drifted off into other things and that's when after that I got a job with Cassandra Complex yes and yeah that's where Mon and I met there and I think that that's you know that practice had a massive impact influence on how we approach architecture in our practice. How did it change you? I think, again, it's that it just opens your eyes to the potential of what buildings can be, like Cass did Pamela Anderson House. That was probably the most well-known project. Mm. And when that was going through, like I really like this story, because when it was going through planning, it sort of got through because it had textured glass, which was, right. was a description of the front. Mm -hmm. So when they started putting all the panels up, it had plastic on it. And some of the panels, or some of the plastic ripped off and then you could actually see that it was an image. And then pretty soon it ended up on the Herald Sun front page, like, you know, tear it down kind of thing. Yes. But it had to go back through VCAD. But it was really interesting because the argument they made was that it was a very traditional classical building because architecture has always had sculptures and faces yes. as part of the facade so that everything else was actually the radical stuff and this was you know this was a very traditional building and mm. that that had a really big impact as okay. well um, and yeah one of the main projects that I worked on there was platypusery that was really awesome basically the brief of that was a sort of display for a zoo that showed a nocturnal animal that was never out during the daytime so basically like there was nothing to really show it was more of a structure than a building to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Essentially the program for the platypusery was we need to make two captive platypus breed because it hadn't been done before. It wasn't a brief of this many bedrooms, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, it's a school, it's this. It was sort of like this quite odd thing that you had to do a lot of research to actually understand. Um, so yeah, I think that again, so much of it was just sort of broadening what you thought architecture could be, could be. and what was about. So how did you make them breed? 
Captive platypus had never been bred before. And yeah, they had twins the first year. I think they had twins the second year. And then I think the first four years they, yeah, had heaps of baby platypus. So it must have been very sexy. Right. Now, did you use that when you started Blah 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 to just say, don't worry about IVF, we've got it covered. <laughs> we've done it with the well, platypuses. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like, well, yeah, we can address any breed. That's because, right. Because, you, know, like, you know, how hard can it be? We've done, we've got something that's never happened before. <laughs> So, it's actually you know, yeah. an excellent example. Yeah, yeah. So when did you and Mon then decide to start Blah Blah Blah? What, what was... Um, it was 2010, I think it was. Mon mm-hmm. had been at ARM for a year after she graduated. I was at BKK at the time. I'd been there for a few years. And we started the practice with Mon's best friend at the time, Jen Wood, who's left early on to go and pursue a master's degree. Okay. In the States, so she yeah. started her own practice over there now. So I think it was just, um, you know, Mon, Mon's always pretty driven and she'd always, you know, wanted to start her own thing. So it just seemed like the appropriate time mm-hmm. to actually do that. And so Jen and Mon would run practice during the day and then at night we'd generally do meetings all together and then go off to do um, client meetings and things after hours so that I could be part of it as well. But yeah, I think, and again, like, I guess I just sort of fall into things, like, and that was just what was happening. So I went along with it and, yeah, it seems to be working out so far. Now, I don't want to precipitate this with a with a correct answer, but, I mean, if you look back, I, I remember one of your first entries into the Think Break Awards, and I'm not sure if it was your first project as well, was it? It was one of the first. Yeah. Because um, some of the first projects we had were projects that were after Cassandra Complex wrapped up. Yes. A couple of clients, we kept some projects running. So yes. I think it was also that it made it a little bit easier to start up because we had a couple of projects to get us launched. Yeah. And then that first project that we put in Think Brick Awards was the Finn House with a red glazed brick wall. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of architects' first projects end up being for one of their parents. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so that was the parent project that helped really yeah. launch the practice as well. So, looking back on that now, would you have done anything differently? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that each project's you're doing what you know at the time. And I think that for us, you know, again, we were sort of playing around with things as much as we could within that project. Mm-hmm. And then the things that follow are always evolutions of you know, the projects and taking them, trying to take them further and yeah. further and further. So, you know, it was a really fun project. And I think Mon's parents just really loved that house and mm-hmm. they ended up selling it, but they were so sad to, to yeah. sell it. But, yeah, I mean, it was really interesting. You know, it was always like that massive wall and the massive wall was the feature of it mm-hmm. and the real identifier for the project yeah. as well. But, yeah, no, I think that I guess you're always, anything that you learn, you try and apply to the next project so then all your other projects and i mean there's mary house there's tiger prawn and you obviously have designed a lot in brick and i should say also not always brick i mean but why brick and maybe think of those couple of projects going back to my early stories of playing around with bricks and again coming out of art practice other types of work that i used to do used to be plaster casting projects Mm -hmm. and i you know there'd be a plaster cast of something and then make thousands of them so it always had this sort of like individual pixel like nature Mm. and then the smaller things would make up a bigger picture or plan or something like that so I think that brick is just an extension from that sort of process that I went through art practice Mm -hmm. but you have so much control over how you can actually build Mm -hmm. something up be it an image within the bricks be it patterning you can layer it up pretty well and I know The other thing too with brick is that, you know, we always leave the brick exposed so that, you know, we're picking it based on the colour and the patterning and, you know, we work heavily through form um, Mm -hmm. but then overlaying the patterning on that and it means that it's built into into the project so it becomes really part of it and, you know, it can't be VM'd out, which is one of the things that we always talk about Mm -hmm. is that, you know, you put it there, it's there, later on someone might, render over or something which is massive crime but it's more that yeah it's sort of part of the project and it's Mm. always there over the years what would be your favorite i know it's like asking someone to choose their favorite child 
one of your most memorable ones? It's sort of hard. I mean, I really liked working on Mary Creek House mm. just because it was just a really odd plan, but the plan worked really, really well. And also, you know, there was a lot of technical aspects in terms of the detailing of the three turrets that run mm -hmm. through the site. Um, yeah, and they were just great clients to work with as well. So I think resi-wise, that's my favourite. And on the civic side as well, although it was a real um, a long road, the project with the Narry Warren Footy Club yes. as well was a really great project just because that was one of those projects that we were involved with from, you know, the ground up. So helping them get funding to do the project and then sort of staying on and actually delivering the project and delivering an outcome that for mm -hmm. them, it, it sort of also to a certain extent secured the financial security of the club because they had a venue that they could actually use for hiring out events and things like that. And yeah, there was something really nice about the holistic approach to that project. Mm -hmm. And I think the one that I'm most excited about at the moment is the new building at Auburn High School yes. um, on the cliff edge. So. It, that, that, and that yeah, looks amazing yeah too. so that's quite exciting and that's in construction at the moment so and working with bricks so much is are there in these different projects has there been anything that surprised you or that you know you didn't expect so you know we work a lot in with form rather yeah. than you know doing hit and miss and screening and treating them as a screen or anything like that yeah. like we're very much about that solid form mm -hmm. and i think it's always surprising how far you can push the envelope in terms of what you can build and shape mm -hmm. through just brickwork mm -hmm. and with just using you know the really standard squints and cants and you know combining them with normal bricks just how free form you can actually get and free flowing you can get with what is essentially a rectangular block. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah which yeah. seems that it has a lot of constraints yeah and you, you speak very passionately about your approach to architecture as, as well as you are and yeah. also being certified. Yeah. Where do you see architects' role in what's going on at the moment in terms of the environment? You know, everyone's pushing to make more sustainable projects at the moment. Many architects, and, you know, we're really trying to do as well is go to that point where it's more than just the architecture, that it's a much more holistic approach to not only how sustainable the building is in terms of its construction at the time, but then in terms of the longevity, how the building can be potentially dismantled and reused and how the materials that are within it can be recycled and used in the future. Mm -hmm. Looking at projects in terms of an entire lifespan in both the making and the ending of the building is something that we're really pushing at the moment. So. Yeah, that's what we're trying to really look at in terms of, particularly with school buildings, because they have 20 years or 30 years, they, there'll be a new pedagogy and they will be reworked. So if you're using materials that, you know, like brick, for example, there's so many options to reconfigure those buildings. And a couple of projects that we've done at Hampton Park Secondary College have been, you know, using sort of adaptive reuse of existing brick buildings on site and transforming them into something completely different that caters for a completely different pedagogy. So there's something nice about that as well, that reusing buildings as much as possible is a, you know, there's so much embodied energy that goes into creating a building and it's how that can be turned into something else is something that's always on our mind too. Yeah. And Scott, you guys have ended the awards for so many years. What's your experience <laughs> been like and any tips? It's a really fun experience because I was sort of saying this earlier that it's one of the few programs where it's not just the architects it's actually the architects and it's builders and it's suppliers and you're all there together celebrating the projects that you've essentially collaborated on and i think that's one of the nicest things about the think brick awards is everyone that's involved in both the conceptual side and the delivery of the project because so often we're working really closely with the suppliers and the manufacturers of the products that it's nice that if it actually gets an award at the end that you're all there to celebrate that mm. moment together. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm wondering, when you started obviously with bricks and sculpting those brick stacks into something yeah. else, do you still sculpt today? Not really. I think architecture has just really replaced <laughs> sculpture for me. And, you know, I think that all of our buildings do have a pretty strong sculptural element to them. Okay. And 
you know, maybe that's just a little bit of ties to the past. But no, I, I don't really miss it. I think I've just sort of drifted into the world of architecture and, yeah, fell in love with that. Well, Scott, it's been so interesting to learn about this and I can really see now all the pieces coming together. But thank you all of these years for participating and always wanting to be part of everything I think I've asked you to do and especially today for being on the podcast. Thank no you. Worries. And thank you so much for everything that you've done over the last 13 years as well for the industry and particularly all of the architecture profession as well. We really appreciate yeah, your love. Cheers, thanks. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please follow, rate and review our podcast. We are always looking for new ways to think brick. If you have an idea of what you'd like to hear about, there's a link in our show notes to let us know.